Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with City of Winkler, Manitoba Mayor Henry Siemens. One of Manitoba's fastest growing cities and the largest center in the Pembea Valley, Winkler's roots are in agriculture. It has become the shopping, entertainment, and industrial center of southern Manitoba. The largest annual event is the Harvest Festival, held the second full weekend of August. With 25% growth in the past 10 years, Winkler has seen several new cultural additions to its list of attractions. Winkler's recreational offerings are abundant as well, with parks, sports facilities, and walking trails catering to outdoor enthusiasts. Winkler's close-knit community fosters a sense of belonging and pride, making it a desirable place to call home for families and individuals alike. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews featuring Winkler Mayor Henry Siemens. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration. At Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the person behind the persona a little bit. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, including one of your council colleagues, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Actually, uh, and it was a long time coming. Uh, I am extremely proud of our community. I, I love Winkler, have always loved Winkler. That said, uh, like anybody else, I had suggestions at various times that I thought maybe could have been done better. And in one of my moments of having a particularly pointed group of uh, suggestions to my wife at dinner one evening, she said, then why don't you do something about it and run for council and make the change? Uh, that kind of hit home a little bit. It hurt a touch, firstly. Uh, but secondly, it hit home and, and we were at a place that uh, at that time I was looking to do uh, some more volunteerism to get a little bit more involved. And so I did. I, I ran, put my name forward, ran for election, was elected as a counselor. And literally the following year, uh, our daughter joined our family and it became particularly important for me to give back to our community in a way that would allow us to create a community that someday she might want to come back from. And we're hoping she launches, we're hoping our son launches and they both go to school. Uh, they both uh, get a career of whatever excites them, but that coming back to Winkler someday would be an option in their world. So Manitoba has the very bad tendency of not having a lot of information on past election results. The last election that I can find that your name stood was in 2010. Is this correct? Is this the first election you put your name forward in or were you on the Actually, ballot? Before I, the 2006 was the first time I put my name forward uh, and I was elected at that time. When I did put my name forward, uh, I looked at the group of incumbents running and there was four incumbents running. And traditionally, in most areas in Manitoba, incumbents are treated fairly well, uh, unless they've had some nefarious dealings, but generally are treated well, particularly in Winkler, though. Uh, incumbents generally are treated well. I saw that two were not running, and there were four of us who put our name forward. And so I looked at the list, and I said, okay, I've got to beat two people to get in. And that's how I worked it, and I did. I managed to squeak in as the number six council vote getter in 2006. 
So you have then been on council for four and a half terms uh, throughout your tenure from 2006 to now 2024 when we're recording this. Correct. What What's changed in the municipal realm from your perspective? Because you have had the position of councillor, deputy mayor, and now from as of the last term, mayor. Has, has the issues of what's been going on in the municipality changed dramatically over that te- time to tenure, or are the same issues just reoccurring just on a larger scale now? I think it's almost entirely different. During this time, the city of Winkler has almost doubled from the time I was first elected to today. How we go about our business has vastly changed. When we were first elected in 2006, at that time, council still had uh, some fairly direct say in terms of what happened and doesn't happen. Maybe a little bit more along the lines of what the community at times even believes today, that if your street isn't getting the snow cleared fast enough, you should phone your councillor and he'll help get it cleared, which is obviously uh, nowhere near the truth. But we used to be able to have uh, say or did have, maybe we never really should have had, but did have fairly direct say into some operational pieces. We would sit around at annual planning as we're trying to finalize our budget and we would have arguments with our director of operations on whether or not he needed a new grader this year. And we were looking at it from a dollars and cents point of view and our director of operations are looking at it from a uh, operational efficiency point of view. I need this piece of equipment to get my job done. And I think the biggest thing that I've seen is a growth now to uh, we as a council behaving much more like the board of directors of the community that we are. Uh, As mayor, really, I am the chair of the board of directors of the city of Winkler. We hire very good staff to do the work that we do. We provide an overall strategic direction for our staff. We provide a budget with when they have to work in. But after that, we let the professionals do what they need to do. So from that aspect, that would be the single biggest thing. But is it hard to get that mindset? Sorry, is that is it hard to get that mindset to uh, get out of that mindset? Because a lot of people, and I'm not saying you, I'm not saying anyone that I've had on the show, but there's a lot of people who say, I'm going to run for council. I'm going to be able to tell the greater operator where they're going to go. Well, I'm going to be able to tell what the when the library is going to be open and how long it's going to stay open. Or I'm going to be able to tell you the, the tax clerk to give you a break on your taxes this year because you're struggling. Is it hard to get out of that mindset? Because as the council, you know, you are the governance side of the administration. Right. It's one of the, the biggest things, Chris, that new councillors, particularly when, when they come in, so often uh, people run on one issue or one concern or one thing that bothers them, and then they get elected, and then they quickly find either they can quickly uh, get that issue dealt with, or they find that there's absolutely nothing that they can do in that regard in terms of of the responsibilities of council and where governance lies and where operations lie. And now you're sitting here and you've got three and a half years of sitting here, A, you've solved the problem or B, you can't do anything about it and you're frustrated and you didn't really have a desire to run outside of that concern and it becomes a tough place to be. Uh, We're been fortunate in the last number of years that we haven't had a lot of one issue candidates who've been elected. We've had some who've chosen to run and for a variety of reasons haven't been successful in being there. But we've had a really good group of people now. I've, as you mentioned, I'm on my the start of my fifth term now uh, on council. We have had one or two new people around the table every single time. So new ideas are coming to the uh, floor we're able to discuss them, we're able to review them. But more so than that, uh, we're also able to have conversations with the people who are running and just to share why are you running, why you should be running. The city also does, and then the province of Manitoba puts forward some really good educational sessions in advance of the election so that those people who choose to do their homework can show up at the table ready to go when they're elected. 
five terms on council, I would imagine that you know that you have not pleased 100% of the people in your community with every single vote that you've made. For those who are listening to this, I see the mayor's head shaking and nodding mm-hmm. approval. So how do you measure the the impact, the vote that you make on every single issue. Is there a metric that you put in place when you have something that comes across to your council table that you say, how is this going to impact our residents for the betterment of the community? Or do you take things as a day-to-day issue just as they come to your table? Just take me through how you ensure that the votes you vote on are in the good of the community. We have a terrific staff who brings forward each one of the pieces and gives us a lot of detail in terms of what we're looking at, why we're looking at it, and the potential ramifications of a vote either way. Those are the the, the easier ones. And I think the community as a whole uh, is generally appreciative if you're doing the best you can with the intentions of making the community a better community. It becomes a little bit harder when somebody uh, specifically on an issue that affects them deeply personally comes forward and and uh, they have a frustration around it and have an anticipation or an expectation that you're going to be able to solve it. When you're not able to then, that's a greater frustration to some people. But I do know that every single time we have uh, a public hearing and there's two people with a concern or we have a public hearing and and we're changing a zoning or we're changing something and the people that come and present and and it's something that concerns them and they passionately present and you still vote against them uh, it is a hard piece to reconcile because we have to remember that for that person that day that was a really big thing in the overall uh, experience of the remaining 13,744 people in our community, that in itself may not have been a big piece, but for that person that day, that was a really important piece. For us, uh, for me personally, it is always very important to me to make sure that we show proper respect, that we give people an opportunity to have their full say, to make their full presentation, that we show up and that we ask good questions, that we make sure that we're educated, and making a decision, taking the weight of how important it is to that person that day into consideration when we deliberate and make a decision. I think the most important piece that we have and that we owe each one of the people that shows up in front of us is to give them the respect of a full hearing and then making sure we ask well-researched questions so that we make the best possible decision, again, taking the greater community into consideration. I have noticed that when I speak to municipal leaders across Canada, that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal governance, though. The average person probably is not showing up to a regular Winkler council meeting and just sitting there for five hours and listening to politicians, elected officials talk about what's going on in the community. And that can stem into an issue where people just don't even come forward with their issues that they're talking to you about in front of council. How do you engage with everyone? And I say everyone, even the people who disagree with you, even the people who didn't vote for you to ensure that you vote on things that are going to impact everyone in a positive way, because yes, you are the last vote. You are the person who has to raise their hand and say yay or nay to an issue. But I'm assuming you're just not taking what administration is giving to you and saying, okay, I'm giving my John Hancock to this. I'm going out to the community and talking to people and asking them for their opinion. Are people willing to give their opinion to you? People generally aren't shy uh, with their opinion. (laughs) One of the things that we noticed, the, the municipal order of governance is, is the order closest to the people. So we run into people at the grocery store. We run into people at the gas station, in the coffee shop. We generally don't have a problem getting an opinion. When there's something in front of us, uh, we also have uh, an ability to reach out, and we do reach out regularly. We make sure uh, over and above that that we're accessible all of the time. Uh, Each one of our council has our cell phone and our email address 
on our city website. People can reach out at any time uh, that they want to talk to us. Uh, we've also just recently init uh, initiated a new thing called Ask the Mayor. So on, on the first Tuesday of every month, we open up council chambers, myself, a couple of councillors, some of our senior administrative staff are there, and we invite the community to come down and talk to us about anything. There's no formality, there's no structure, there's a hot cup of coffee there waiting for you. And we wanna talk about anything that people wanna talk about. We wanna to try to remove some of the intimidation of council and particularly council chambers. When you come to a regular meeting of council, there's a lot of formality to it. There's uh, motions and seconds and debate and, and closures and votes. And it's fairly intimidating to John Q. Public if you haven't been to a lot of meetings and if you don't recognize the reason behind all of the formality. So we quite often have people come to a meeting and they leave a little bit discouraged because they didn't quite understand what was happening. They maybe had a question or a comment, but they didn't quite grasp maybe where that question or comment would have fit. So they end up not asking. So this is our initiative. We've just had our first one, actually. Uh, and we will leave the first Tuesday of every month open now. We had 11 people come by. I think the average age was about 81. So we had uh, people come by with a greater interest in, hey, what's going on? Uh, not a lot of questions at this one. But I think as people recognize that this is an option that's available to them, if they don't feel comfortable picking up the phone and, and sending uh, either a text or a phone call, maybe this is a venue to come and an opportunity to ask directly or make your point directly. Uh, in our first session, actually, it was mostly people having a comment. We had very few questions, mostly just people wanting to comment on something that they had seen. So... I, you and I both know that there's a role that the there's a jurisdictional role that the municipality plays in the day to day lives of people in this country and in the city of Winkler. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say that the average resident doesn't know. I think they don't even care. And I say that respectfully to the people who are listening to this right now. And that's Chris saying that that's not the mayor saying that. So if you want to send your email, send them to me. The average resident over the last probably about five, 10 years, I would say, it has blurred the jurisdictional lines between provincial and federal and municipal. I hear from municipal leaders, mayor, oh, I hear from mayors from across Manitoba that more and more times than not, they're getting approached about provincial issues, about federal issues. How do you tell people that's not your jurisdiction? Because you are the closest to the people. You are the most accessible. You have your phone number. You have your yes. email on a website. How do you tell people it's not your jurisdiction without telling them, go go complain or go talk to your MLA, your MP, because it's just not, the municipality can't do anything about it? First and foremost, I, I think the key, again, because we are so local and, and we're so accessible. First and foremost, generally, we give an ear to the concern. Uh, we let them know quickly, uh, we're not going to be able to do anything about this, but we care and we're interested in hearing it. Uh, I'll regularly send emails to the MLA or the MP on people's behalf and say, this is coming your way. Uh, this is something that this person is very concerned about. But I think the most important thing when people have a concern, and there is, uh, and I would certainly say, Chris, I would agree with you strongly, most people don't know where to go. And sometimes it's a matter of education. Sometimes it's just a matter of not understanding because so many of these jurisdictional authorities do have somewhat blurred lines between the different orders of government. So it's not always 100% clear. And it's impossible, even at times, for us as elected officials to really get a solid handle on who should we be going to, who should be helping us with it. So I, I'm rarely surprised when somebody comes with something like that. The first thing we typically like to do, though, give an ear, make sure that people have an opportunity just to share. Because quite often, that's the single biggest thing when, when you've been rebuffed absolutely everywhere you've gone, and finally, for someone just to take a few minutes and listen, it helps to bring the stress level down. It helps to, to 
be able to have productive conversations after that that lead to them being able to take their issue to the next place. How often is it the like you talk about they just want an ear sometimes they just want to have someone listen to their conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. How often do, is it that there are probably better chances that you will get an MLA or an MP on the phone quicker than an, a resident mm -hmm. because your title as mayor sort of elevates you a little bit into a status that people are willing to give the mayor a call back then so sort of Correct. Joe na no name on the street. I would say uh, in our area in particular, and I couldn't maybe speak to other areas, both our local MLA and our MP are amazing at getting back. Uh, I hear very rarely do I hear from people that they're not able to get responses. Um, I think the frustration is that you're not able to get a face-to-face -face maybe some of the time because they're both uh, busy, whether it's Ottawa or Winnipeg. But I do think uh, when people know where to go and when people are, are stepping into it generally they don't have a problem getting a response it's the face-to-face -face that's maybe not there or getting stuck in the bureaucracy of it not everyone knows uh, exactly where to go and how to get there and if they've got somebody who gives them a listening ear gives them a chance to vent uh, maybe directs a little bit let's take this path instead and that helps get them going so I want to turn to segment two now, and the, this segment, I'm going to preface the first question by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. He is one vote on said council. So this is his opinion. They may match up, but at the end of the day, this is his opinion. Mayor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Winkler today as of recording this? We are struggling uh, to get housing. We're a rapidly growing community. We can't build housing fast enough. We can't get enough affordable housing, social housing fast enough. Uh, we're trying to work with both Canada and Manitoba to uh, participate in any programs that they have. Unfortunately, we've been less than successful recently in accessing some of those programs. I think a big part of that challenge is that despite the need that we feel we have, our need to the greater community just isn't quite as great as some of theirs are. And there's been an awful lot of change in the last three or four years. We've gone from basically zero interest rates to now five and a half, six percent interest mortgage interest rates that make it much harder for people to be able to buy housing. And there's been a a slow resetting of expectations from people looking to buy houses. Maybe the single family house, uh, two car, <laughs> uh, three bedroom, two garage, uh, two bath type of house isn't as easily ac as accessible as it was before. I think a lot more people are looking at condos or looking at smaller units or different units. Some people are reconsidering whether they can own at all or whether they're going to need to remain renters at least for a period of time. So we are really, really struggling to be able to uh, find ways to get enough housing built for all the people that are coming. As of today, we have about a thousand unfilled jobs in our area and there are people that would like to come at times, but they can't find a place to live. So what used to be just a matter of finding enough employees now becomes a matter of finding enough employees and finding enough housing, which becomes quite stressful for our employers. So there's a few things I want to play in the sandbox a little bit. And I want to start sure. by asking this. Are developers knocking on your door? Are developers coming to Winkler and saying, we want to build, we just need the area, the infrastructure to build these houses so we can sort of help alleviate some of these issues that you've just talked about there? We have uh, three or four local developers who are building and are doing a, a fairly good job of doing that. It's just the uh, how quickly our market has changed from that single family unit to now a different type of unit that's being a little bit of a challenge. We also have uh, where we need the help from Canada and Manitoba, particularly is for 
uh, affordable or social housing, meaning subsidized housing. That aspect of it, we can't do that on our own. We absolutely have to have Manitoba and Canada at the table or it doesn't work. It's not possible to do. We currently have 90 uh, social housing units in Winkler. On the wait list for that housing, there's 180 people on the wait list. So we have more people, almost twice as many people on the wait list as we actually have in housing now. The growth over the last six months to a year, our wait list has almost doubled. So we know that the affordability crisis that's affecting all of us is particularly harsh, those on the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, place and they're struggling. And if in fact we can't find ways to accommodate, it's going to lead to greater social ills and, and we're going to end up with significantly higher costs than other ends. And that's a concern to us. You are a hub in Southern Manitoba, Winkler is. I would say you have a yeah. population of, I think you were saying about 15,000, give or take. But Correct. that that is not the f official count because you have uh, you have inflow from other communities who come in to use your resources, come in to use your services, come in to use your hospitals, who look for these housing units. I think I read a, a article before this interview that said you were one of the fastest growing cities in the province of Manitoba today. So I'm not sure if that still holds up or when that article was published, it but does. that was so. You and I both know that housing is not a municipal issue. It may be because of downloading, but it is not something that municipalities traditionally worry about. They worry about the right. infrastructure below the ground, the invisible infrastructure, the wastewater, the pipes the, that go to the, all these houses. What does Winkler do in the short term to entice the federal government, entice the provincial government to start hopefully funding some of these affordable housing, these sort of uh, housing units that are so desperately needed to help not only Winkler, but the surrounding area as well. Well, one of the things, and you alluded to it earlier, Chris, uh, one of the benefits that we have, that I have in this chair that I sit in today, is generally I can get a reply to uh, an email. So we've been reaching out to uh, provincial ministers, to federal ministers, uh, sending emails, sending notes, requesting meetings. We've had a fair number of our local uh, government out in our area. The ministers themselves have come out to the area to be able to show them firsthand what we're looking at, to be able to uh, discuss with them the benefits actually of supporting housing in this area in the fact that it's actually cash flow positive if you do so because every single time you help us get some housing built, we're sending more tax dollars your way through payroll taxes, through any number of other consumption taxes that are there. So if you help get these kinds of things going, it helps you to do some of the other things. Uh, our uh, premier has been really good uh, at saying that the economic horse pulls the social cart. And we've had opportunity to meet with him and to stress that if he helps this economic horse stay healthy, we can pull a bigger social cart together with him. Uh, he's been receptive to those conversations. He's been very open to those conversations. Uh, we're waiting eagerly now to see what the provincial budget will hold on April 2nd to see if there's some opportunities there. But as a rule, uh, similar to, as I mentioned earlier, quite often people just want to be heard. We're feel that we're being heard right now by our provincial government. We're having an opportunity to reach out. We're getting return phone calls. We're getting return emails. Uh, they're coming to our area. They're having good conversations with us. Our hope is that that being heard also leads to an opportunity to jointly grow this area of the province further. I'm going to poke the political bear a little bit here, there, Mayor, and I'm going to ask you, you've been talking about the provincial government federal government needs to come to the table as well. Do they not? I've been <laughs> struggling more to connect with the federal government. Uh, not the only mayor who's told me that. Uh, good connection and really good response rates from my local MLA. Uh, unfortunately, through the Housing Accelerator Fund, the national piece that, that came out, $4 billion to invest into 
getting more housing built. We were on the outside looking in. We were just informed that our application had not been successful. Uh, I did struggle to try to get through as well. Uh, and I recognize the housing minister is a very, very busy person when he's given away $4 billion. Uh, but I was not able to connect with him to have a conversation. Did they tell you why? Did they tell you why that you didn't get the, why you got rejected? We did not. Uh, my understanding was uh, that they had over 500 applications, so massively oversubscribed. Uh, okay. We have to wonder a little bit in that some of the deliverables that they were looking for, which was a significant intensification of building, a change of some building codes to allow as a right to have fourplexes built on single family lots some of those changes we had already made so when we put our application in the we couldn't tick that box as saying we're prepared to do it we'd already done it so whether we lost points or not by being proactive like that we don't know and i would certainly never want to guess for someone else why the decision was made to not support ours again i suspect that what all was said and done and the scoring was done we just simply didn't get enough points on their rating piece. Uh, I have heard that there's been a number of Manitoba communities who have been successful. Uh, I'm not at liberty to share who they are. But again, in those communities, it may literally be a fact that there's a greater need in those communities than ours uh, in terms of a, a true social need to get something done. In our area, typically, when enough people say no to us, then we find a way to do it on our own. And that's uh, that's both a blessing and a curse, but it is a matter of, uh, we have a very industrious local Southern Manitoba business community who steps into those needs and helps meet many of the things that aren't actually our jurisdictional authority, but because we're looking for uh, a group of people, a quality of life, that we find different ways to get there. I, I know I have listeners inside Ottawa at uh, on Parliament Hill. So if anyone is in the Minister of Housing's uh, uh, office right now listening to this interview, call the mayor back, please. That'd be greatly appreciated. <laughs> There's we my would little love to have a conversation <laughs> around that. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, I want to talk about one last thing before we, because I'm cautious of time here. So hopefully you have an extra five yes. minutes for me. Um, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities released a survey last year that said it cost the average municipality $107,000, average municipality, I should say, average municipality $107,000 for infrastructure for one unit of housing in Canada. Now, that is a significant number. Now, yes. you are a growing community, and I can imagine there is a need to balance the growth with the here and now. You do not want to grow your community fast enough where it, it impacts people's financial pocketbooks negatively. But you have right. to realize that the growth needs to happen. How do you balance growth versus here and now? Because you want to see your city grow. You understand that the reality is it's growing, but you don't want to do it on the people who are struggling right now during a time where inflation is the highest it's been in some time. It is a challenge every single day, Chris. We recognize that growth is not uh, something you can turn on and off like a switch. Uh, the decisions we make today affect growth, not necessarily tomorrow, but five or 10 years into the future. And when we make other decisions, they don't stop growth necessarily today, but they stop it in the future. So we always have to try to carefully balance uh, the services we provide today, making sure that we have a well-funded asset management plan so that when something needs to be repaired, renewed, or replaced, that we're able to do so. But at the same time, we also know that everything that we do is going to cost more money tomorrow. And if we are going to try to provide tomorrow's services, that are going to be more money tomorrow than they are today with the same tax base, it's going to become exponentially more expensive. So to have a, a level of growth is important to be able to fund the things that we want to do. We've also been really aware of and are focused on having growth pay for growth. 
So we want to make sure that uh, we're not asking people in the old sector of Winkler to pay for new developments. So we're working with our developers to making sure that that new growth that's being built, that it's been funded properly, that as we look now to add that into our assets, that we also look immediately to start funding the repair of it. So as soon as we roll that into our book of, of owned properties, our owned pieces, that even though that road isn't going to need a significant repair for 20, 25 years, we're starting to fund that today. And that's something we've been working on very hard for the last five or six years is funding our asset management plan. Uh, we recognize that we have about $500 million worth of stuff, whether it's land or pipes or trucks or buildings, you name it. And that is all going to have to be repaired, replaced or renewed at some point in time. Our renewal plan shows us that right now we're about 5% short on our, on our actual ability to replace it. It's not huge, but it is a little bit short and we wanna make sure that we get to it and make sure that when it's there, that we're able to do so, that we don't have to wait for Manitoba or Canada to get involved, that we're able to do it when it's time to do. Uh, obviously, we're going to make sure that we lobby extensively, that Canada and Manitoba are at the table where it's appropriate for them to be at the table, but that we're never waiting for them to come to the table. We often forget about the fourth pillar that goes along in the, any housing strategy, and that is the people of the community that you reside in. Um, are the people wanting to see the growth that you, the council's looking at, the council wants to see? Like, do you have buy-in from the people of Winkler to say, you know what, we're on the right path, you're doing it in a sustainable way, that it's not on the backs of us, but you're looking for other avenues to help hopefully offset some of the costs that might be coming on the backs of me uh, me and my we wife have and my neighbor. For many years in Southern Manitoba, as we've been growing out the, the entire Southern Manitoba area, uh, the fact that this growth is coming because there are jobs, because there's economic activity that's that's here, generally, I think the community supports it well. Uh, we're still one of the lowest taxed uh, municipalities in the province. We've been really, really judicial at keeping that number as reasonable as we possibly can, that we provide the services that our community wants and needs, but we do it in a way that all of us can afford because that's ultimately extremely critical. So as we continue to have jobs here and as our community gets bigger and our growth looks like about three and a half to 4% growth, which is probably the up at the upper end of what we can handle on a year over year basis. But we've done that now for just about 20 years. We've had that three and a half percent year over year growth. We've been careful to build out our services. We've been careful to make sure that we keep our taxes as reasonable as we possibly can while providing what our community needs. I do believe, at least from what I'm hearing from people, as a rule, they're fairly happy with where they see Winkler going. It's good to hear. On the flip side of the, my very first question on this about the issues, what does Winkler get right, in your opinion? What is the thing that when you go to AMM, when you go talk to municipal leaders across Manitoba, you boast about what's going on in your community? Uh, I think the biggest things that we boast is that we're, we're working to get our nuts and bolts right. Uh, we're building everything that we're doing out for a population of 25,000 people. So we're planning water and wastewater infrastructure to get to that place. Uh, we have a really good uh, road maintenance pro program, uh, really good uh, sewer pipe renewal and relining program. Uh, we work to make sure that our recreation facilities are up to date and are current and are well maintained. Um, I think from everything that I would look at, we have a really, really good staff, right from uh, city manager Jody Penner and his directors on down. We have amazing people in Winkler doing amazing things that make our job most days much easier just because of the quality of what they're doing. So I want to turn to my last segment and it's my favorite segment. It's actually my, my very favorite segment because 
on April 12th, I will be in the city of Winkler. After the AMM conference this year, I'm coming and I've already booked my hotel room. Excellent. So I'm spending a day in Winkler before I have to head off back to Regina. So I've already asked your counselor, uh, Michael Grenier. Uh, oh my God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, it just, my, I was, for some reason, I thought his name wasn't Michael for a second. I apologize, Michael. Uh, but Michael <laughs> Grenier. Um, what are the hidden gems that you would tell a tourist to come see in the city of Winkler? We have a number of really, really nice things that I think are important to say. Um, Discover Nature Sanctuary uh, is, is a little bit of a hidden gem in our industrial park. Uh, definitely go see that. Uh, Bethel Heritage Park uh, in the site of the old hospital grounds, I think is vital to see. It's got a, a copy of the Bethesda Fountain there as well then we would invite you to take a look at the PWN's concert hall, uh, repurposed old church. Uh, make sure you visit Winkler Arts and Culture, a repurposed old water treatment plant. Uh, I would suggest that you are going to be a little bit early April 12th, but do swing by the Winkler Golf Club. It's a really nice links course. They've got a new clubhouse that's been uh, built by uh, private donations. The city of Winkler wasn't at the table. We had a community uh, business group initiative that made that happen. There's just so many different things that that you should see. Uh, you should visit the Meridian Exhibition Center. Uh, we have an indoor turf facility. Uh, we have a, a fairly new ice rink there. And the other thing that we're just about to do is to do a, a rebuild of our Centennial Arena. We have a project that was built for Canada's Centennial and it's been needed an upgrade for many, many years. We're dotting the I's and crossing the T's right now on that project. We're hoping to be able to send that out to tender shortly after after the hockey season ends this year. It's it, it, There's a lot of stuff to do. I would love to tour you around when you're in town, Chris. I, I would really like to just to be able to show you our industrial park, uh, not per se uh, a tourist attraction, but it is second to none. Our entire community is built on small local businesses growing to be slightly less than small local businesses, and that's attracted others. Well, I certainly look forward to visiting Winkler. I'm excited for it. I've made a promise on this show. If you come on the show, I'm coming to your community and I've made sure that I spent an extra two it. days in Manitoba and I'm going to be in Winkler and at AMM. So if you're at AMM, anyone who's listening to this in Manitoba, come find me at the back of the Bain Hall because I'll be there doing these live interviews. Uh, sort of shameless plug there for myself. <laughs> Before <laughs> I let you go, Henry, I have one last question for you and it's the million dollar question sure. so we started by talking about you we started talking about your duty to serve we're ending by talking about the city of winkler and i've got to know what makes the city of winkler such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family it is without a shadow of a doubt it's the people we have a tremendously entrepreneurial group of people in winkler when there's a problem we find a way to solve that problem that's at the business community level. That's at the social level. When we look at uh, Central Station, th that organization that looks to connect the different service providers to make sure that people who maybe are sliding through the cracks, give them one more option to catch. And we know that even in a, in a prosperous community like Winkler, not everyone always benefits equally from that success. Then when some people are being left behind to have somebody that can help them uh, just to give them a hand up to help them get back to an equal footing is something that's important. When we look at our, uh, our faith based community, there's so many faith based organizations, churches and others that are supporting and helping. I think that idea of if there's a problem, let's find a way to step into it and solve it. We really are a community where people make the difference because they are interested in seeing better and seeing that. And there's a, a hope and an optimism when you're part of the solution. And I think that's what makes Winkler a little bit different 
is that there's nobody in the community that doesn't want to be part of improvement. Mayor Henry, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honest to good displeasure. This is a great way to end a uh, interview session. Um, your answers have been eye-opening, and I'm so looking forward to visiting Winkler later on in April. So thank you. thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Now, if today's episode has sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last year. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.